So today, what we will cover, I we, we have a couple of topics today to, to cover. So I didn't um, prepare slides. I will kind of be drawing and waving my hands and doing some, some code. Um, <clears throat> because it, it is a little bit mix mixture of things that we talking today. So the first thing that we need to talk about is this um, IO monad and the magic of pure code and impure code. So there, there are, um, let me start uh, drawing things. So let, first maybe here. So if I, if I have, um, Please work. So my Vim is not working. That's not that great. What happened? Yes. All right. So if you have functions, um, so I have function f, and it takes you know normal types. If it takes normal types and it produces kind of a normal type outputs, um, then I typically, we consider them pure functions. Uh, and pure functions are easy to test and they have certain properties. Um, however, if my uh, function takes some, um, some arbitrary type and it returns an IO action and the IO action contains, um, contains nothing. So it's a kind of, a, you know, um, an empty, um, yeah, the, the action doesn't really have any value, right? Uh, I could have uh, I could have uh, an action that returns an int or returns a string, uh, and some actions like you know get line. Re, uh, it's an IO um, IO action that returns a, a string, uh, but sometimes and most of the time we sort of work like this, um, and it doesn't mean it doesn't have a side effect. It could have a side effect, but we don't care what what it is, right? So if we have functions like this. Uh, especially with IO monad, uh, we tend to call them that they are impure because they deal with some sort of effects, some, some side effects. And we've already discussed that we try to uh, group effects into internal and external uh, effects. And they are both in Haskell, they are both dealt through monads, but the external ones, they have a special monad, the IO monad, right? All the internal ones, they have um, a, a slightly different way of managing it, but they still kind of deal with the effects. Um, and it, it, it is a little bit hard to explain it. It's, um, and the language is not that precise. So if you look for it, if you uh, Google for those, um, those topics online, you will see people having a lot of opinions and a lot of conflicting explanations. And it, somehow it, it is a little bit um, difficult because you know it, it comes from mathematics, from category theory, and then you have computer scientists, which usually come from you know uh, programming hardware and imperative programming. You have to tell the computer what to do, and those two words, this abstract mathematical world and the kind of the very pragmatic practical world, they kind of have to merge. And on this, like the, the merging thing is happening now. It, it's relatively new. Uh, those two kind of fields are sort of uh, converging, uh, but we, we haven't worked out exactly how to deal with it. And I mean, we, we did, but you know, it's a little bit hard, to, like I'm not a mathematician myself, so it's a little bit hard for me to explain uh, those things too. Uh, but, but anyway, we, we have those internal and external effects. And for example, for the internal effects, we have a state monad. Uh, we, we have ones which we already know, uh, for example, um, either uh, it's, a, it's a nice kind of uh, monadic uh, construct, which allows you to handle errors or handle some kind of forks in your computation, right? So if I have some sort of computation and at some point I can have kind of a split into the uh, like error news or a, a error uh, driven path or a correct path, then I can use either. If I have to keep track of some sort of state, I can use a state monad uh, and then I have kind of a container where I can simulate uh, a concept of mutation of state uh, because I can update the state. It doesn't mean that dealing with the internal effects is not pure. Like given a particular state, my functions kind of update the state to the, to the new state. 
uh, but given the same state, it always gives the same next state. Uh, so the functions which operate on that, they are kind of clearly pure, uh, but the, the construct allow me, allows me to, to keep track of what that state is. Uh, and the state monad is uh, quite useful if you, for example, want to keep track of some sort of uh, representation of the state in your program. Um, like, for example, in tic-tac-toe, you may want to keep track of what is the current state of the board. You could model it. Um, so, for example, in the tic-tac-toe <clears throat> case, <clears throat> sorry, you could have um, you could have a board. Uh, and the board is some some type, right? So you, you say, I have uh, a type of my board and uh, you can represent it as a list or you can represent it as a functional mapping or you can represent it as a matrix, whatever you want, you know, it, it's up to you, uh, up to you, what, what you want the board to be. And then you can have uh, transitions. You can say, I have um, a move which takes, so my function move takes a board uh, and takes a um, particular move uh, that I want to, to make and it generates a new board, right? And your function move is pure. It takes a particular state of the board, the move that you want to apply to it and you know it, uh, gives you back a particular board back. And that's a perfectly fine, perfectly normal way of representing the domain. And that will allow you to keep track of what is the state of the board without really needing to have a mut mutable state, right? Um, but programming that might be fine and it will work, but you may think it's a little bit of a handful for keep, keep, keeping track of this board all the time because you have to pass this board like everywhere uh, and you have to keep track of, um, of how this passing goes. Uh, and also you cannot that easily compose things on top of the board because you have to pass it, right? So for example, you, you may want to say, um, I want to empty the board. So em empty. So to empty the board, you will have to take a board and return a new empty board, right? And then you may say, um, you may want to find next uh, best move. And again, you will have to take a board and return a move, right? So you you see, um, I have to pass this kind of board all the time. And um, maybe I want to do some do notation or maybe I want to kind of combine it into some sort of a sequence of, of actions. So then if I want to model it slightly differently, I could use the state monad and I could model the, my board as something that uh, retains a particular state. And then my functions would be simplified because I would have, uh, so my board would become kind of like a monadic construct. And then I would only need to say, I want to empty and then you, you pass it a board, you pass that state. And then it will kind of make transition from the current state of the board to the new state of the board, but within this monadic construct, right? Uh, and then I, you could say uh, move and you would pass it a move and a board. And then you don't need to pass it this, you know, that, that, that initial state because that initial state is already here. The initial state is already in the construct in the, in the board itself. And then you, uh, for this next best move, um, again, you, um, you pass it a board and then it returns you the best move. Uh, it, this one looks exactly the same as the previous one because we're not really changing the state of the board, right? So this one takes this monadic construct, but it doesn't really update the state. Those two would kind of update the, uh, the state of the board. So it, it depends a little bit on the style and it depends a little bit on what exactly what you want to do. You can either use this sort of more pure way of dealing with state by not having mutable state at all. Or you may say, yeah, I could do it, but it be, then my program will become harder or more uh, cumbersome to work with. Therefore, I will kind of model my state in a sort of a monadic construct and then I will keep track, keep updating it, uh, but I, 
it doesn't mean your functions are not pure. They are still pure. It's just that you have kind of a construct in, in functional um, and fu functional kind of way of thinking of how you capture that state. Um, so, um, so Marco asked a question if we will be talking and previewing tasks one and two, we will. Um, so there is a deadline for what time, what day is today? Yeah, there is a deadline for reviews. So I would request you all to do some reviews of the tasks in the submission system. And then once the reviews are over, then I will kind of, we will discuss them in the class. So hopefully next week, uh, all the reviews are in. I think the deadline is like 28th of February. So you guys have a week to go through some of the um, submissions and uh, kind of um, review them, peer review them. And then we will, next week we will kind of discuss. Um, all right, so, so this is the in, internal, um, this is uh, all internal uh, state. Um, and one more comment, like um, you might be tempted not to use the type system uh, because you get sort of um, like the, when, when you learn programming, uh, especially if you're coming from Python or if you're coming from JavaScript or if you're coming from any dynamic language, but even if you're coming from C or C++, you tend to, uh, if you need to, to type something, you tend to use a very primitive type system. Uh, so for example, if I have a student, so let's say um, I want to have a student and uh, the student has some properties, like for example, uh, a name and a surname and yeah, maybe age uh, or some student ID, right? So when you're planning your domain in, in normal programming languages, you tend to say, well, okay, uh, that will be a string, uh, that will be a string, uh, that will be maybe an int, uh, and this, I don't know, maybe a string as well, right? But if that's, and that, that is okay, but that doesn't give you a lot of information. So for example, if I have uh, a function set name, right? Um, and that function takes a string, Right, so um, I'm using kind of a um, imperative uh, pseudocode here. So if, if I have a function, yeah, let, let's use Haskell. So I have a set name and that function um, takes uh, a student, uh, takes a string and returns uh, a student, right? Um, so if, if you do this, um, what happens if you pass uh, the, the second parameter you pass, you know, 23, something like this, right? Is it a legal name? No, it's not a legal name, but it is a legal string, right? So if you uh, make your type system generic like this, uh, you will not be able to make certain guarantees that um, certain uh, invariants or certain conditions are already held, right? So if you, if you say, okay, my student has a name and the name is a string, then you kind of losing the ability to express certain constraints and certain guarantees that you could if you use a proper type system. Okay, uh, so for example, if I have, um, if I have, um, you know, I, I, I do set name and I have some student S and then I have the name uh, and the name, um, so I have let name and the name came from something. Like let's say the name came from um, a user input or uh, a file or something, right? So I I, I kind of uh, so I got the name here from somewhere, right? And it is a string, right? So at some point I have to validate if my name is correct or not. So where do I do it? Do I do it at that point? Maybe. Do I do it here? Yeah, maybe as well, right? I don't know. Like it depends where where you're dealing with stuff and where you have to have this guarantee. So the better approach is you say, no, no, no. The name is actually of type name, right? So the name is a name and the name you, you just say, you know, type name is a string. Uh, you can do it as simple as that. Uh, it's it's a kind of a type alias. You, you defined your new type 
which is called name, but it has all the properties and it behaves exactly the same as a string. It just have its own name. Um, and it, in Haskell, it's really uh, zero overhead abstraction. Like it costs nothing to either do this where you say name is a string, uh, you know, name is a surname is a string and name is a name. In Haskell, it makes no difference whatsoever. In many programming languages, you have additional overheads by doing this, but in Haskell, you don't. Uh, and that's, you, you are kind of really encouraged to do that. And it has two big benefits. One big benefit by, of doing that is that here, suddenly your function is meaningful, right? You have a function which takes a student, a name and returns a new student. And that kind of just by looking at the type, right? And even if you Google, like Google it, you will get the function which allows you to sort of mutate the name of a student, right? You kind of see it from the type definition. So it's a self-documenting thing. If you set here a string, uh, especially if you, for example, say, you know, if you say set props, right? And the student takes name, uh, surname, and an age. Um, so if you are uh, setting the properties of the student and you know, you're setting name, surname and age, and this signature is much more readable than if you set string and string, right? Um, you, you have to remember which one was the name and which one was the surname. Um, yeah, let me, let's make it even more real, like uh, set name uh, and the set name takes name and the surname and then sets it to the student, right? And like, if you call it string, you sort of don't, you have to remember which one is which, right? Uh, in your code. Uh, but if you make it properly type, uh, uh, surname and the name, then it's obvious which one is which. And you have additional thing, um, surname. So additional, th additional thing is that if you got name from somewhere and you have certain constraints of what name can be and cannot be, then this string uh, following your constraints cannot, cannot be a legal name, right? It is a legal string, but it is not a legal name. So if I, for example, have, um, if I have this um, function here, right? I'm getting a name from file, right? And this function uh, will return me a maybe name, right? Uh, maybe name. And then if this function, like if I read something which is like this, I will return nothing. But if I got a legal name, I will return a name. So I have guarantee that the name uh, of type name is kind of properly formatted, whatever the constraints are. So when I get a name and it is uh, not nothing, then I know that I can pass it and this has a, those properties that I want it will have, right? So you can check kind of everything on entry. And then once the type has been created, once the value has been created, you have a guarantee that this value will not have invalid state because you can only have valid names in your, in your code. You cannot enforce it on, on string, right? Because this is still a valid string. Uh, but by your own rules, by your own type system, you can enforce a rule that this is not a valid name and you will never have a name look like this, right? Um, so, you know, don't do, don't do primitive types, always do uh, types that convey some, some meaningful information, right? Uh, so, con con you know, construct those types and deal with the types from your domain and of course, use the primitive types beneath the scene, like as, I, as I've used here for the name and the same for the surname, right? That, you know, there is no point reinventing uh, something that string kind of captures very well, right? Uh, maybe even a student ID can be a string, right? So uh, student ID also can be a string. And then you have certain validation point on entry. Usually you do that when you're reading it from the IO monad or when you are yeah, reading it from database or from the user input, uh, then you have to do it once. And then once you created the value, when you, once you created the student ID, uh, 
then you know it cannot be an invalid student ID because the invalid thing is nothing. Like you, you don't you 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 separated the error news path into a different path, and it you know the those types are always correct. If I do I do string, then I like in my program in my flow. I carry strings around and I have no guarantee because as I said, like even an empty string is a legal string. So I like, I cannot enforce anything here. But if I say set name takes a name, then it cannot take an empty string because empty string cannot be a legal name, right? Um, all right, so that's kind of a bit of a rant, uh, but it's kind of important for you to use those features in your uh, in your tasks and in your assignments. Like always make those types uh, because it really makes your programming much easier. It makes your function signatures much more meaningful and it allows you to, to keep track of what you don't need to care about. Like you don't need to ever check if the name is a legal name after it has been created because you have a guarantee that it is. Whereas if you're passing strings around and maybe you're concatenating it or whatever, then you have problems. And also if I have if I have a name which is a string um, and I, um, I try to concatenate it with something else, then it will work. But if I have it as a name, um, then you are in charge of defining if it is legal or not to concatenate two names, right? And if you didn't define that you can concatenate names, then uh, maybe that's what you don't want. Maybe names cannot be concatenated, right? Um, all right, so uh, that was a little bit of a rant. Uh, so let's get back to our monad thing. So um, the internal effects are relatively easy. I think it's kind of relatively easy to understand that functions which uh, produce, you know, um, which uh, take a particular state and operate on that state are pure. So given a particular state, the new state that it, it has, it's kind of the same. And it, it, it kind of is like almost like doing this. So you take the initial state and then you produce the, you know, the, the next state. Um, so the function is pure, but instead of doing that, we have kind of like a, a bit of a shortcut and we do that. And this state transition is captured inside the state. So you could say, yes, we mutating a state and it's impure, but that's not necessarily strictly true. So like um, it, you know, testing this is much easier because you can mock the initial state much in, in a much easier way, but, but it's almost the same, almost identical. And, and doing it this way allows you to do this do notation and allows you to do this kind of a sequence inside F of what you want to do, right? So like sometimes this one is fine, um, as I said, like for example, with the board, right? So if I, I, if I need to do something with my board, I can do this and it will feel fine inside the body. But sometimes you feel, yeah, the body is like, I have to do a couple of things in sequence uh, on top of the board. And then I have to keep track, like it, it's, it gets a little bit messy because of like composing the functions. So then a solution to that is to, to use a monad and to do this. And then inside my F, I, I have a do notation and then I can do, you know, I can do things in sequence uh, on, on the board. And I have this kind of an, a nice, um, so I have this nice ability to read from the um, um, from the monad with the with the arrow notation, right? So it it makes yeah programming a little bit easier. So okay, I I hope you sort of getting it. If not, you will need to read the book. <laughs> I mean, the lectures are fine, but the lectures are just very com compressed, kind of a um, quick overview, and you get a more slow and more kind of elaborate explanations in the book. All right, so then IO. Um, IO is a bit of a mystery, but it's really kind of the same. So imagine that we want to write a function, uh, any function, again, like function f, which does something with the real world, okay? And we want it to be pure. So how would you do a function which works in with the real world and it's kind of pure? 
um, well, you, you, your signature would have to be something like this. It takes the, the world and then does something to it and returns a new state of the world, right? So of course we cannot write function like this, but we can constrain our world to something smaller, right? So what if we constrained like um, informally that the entire world is just two streams, right? Uh, it's a standard input and standard output, right? Um, let's constrain it to two constructs. Uh, so the world is just a state of what is on the standard input and what is on the standard output, right? So if I have nothing, uh, so like if I have um, on the input, I have nothing and on the output, I have nothing, then that's my state of the world, right? It's, uh, it's empty. My world is empty, right? So that's one state, right? And then I can have another state. I can have a state when the input queue has a uh, word Marius in it and the output queue is empty, right? Or no, no, no empty string. I actually have nothing in there. That's another state, right? So I have state two and I have state one. Um, and what else can, can I have? Well, I can have um, state three, which says input stream input is empty and the output output is Marius, right? So now we have kind of a, a very primitive model of an outside world and we're modeling it with two queues. One is the standard input and one is the standard output. And my program is kind of in the middle, right? So now my program takes the state of the world and produces another state of the world, right? Um, so if f um, so if f takes uh, state one, right, uh, and produces produces what? So what f can produce from from empty state one? Well, it could produce state three, right? It cannot change anything in the input, but it can change something in the output. I can print something out, right? So if, if the input is empty, then I can change it to an empty, to, to this kind of identity state one, or I can manipulate what is on the output, right? So I could possibly have state three, right? Um, so if I produce, if, if I take state one in, then um, as a output, uh, I could have state three. Uh, is, the, is F pure? Yes, it's pure. I mean, given the same input state, it always produces the same output state, right? Um, okay, so what if I have, um, what, what if I have state two? What states can I produce? I can eat, I can read from, from the input, right? I can uh, get a line or get a word and I can eat up the, that state and make it into state one or state three, right? So I can kind of manipulate it by manipulating those cues, right? So in that sense, Iomonad kind of wraps around this input and output cues and it sequences them in such a way that given a particular state of the, of the world, it will always produce the same consistent state of the world, state of those cues, right? Um, it doesn't mean that uh, Haskell knows when somebody types, like if, if, if in my function f, I have, um, if I have, you know, uh, get line, um, then of course Haskell doesn't know that um, the person who, who gets the prompt types Marius, right? But that's, that's not what Haskell does. What Haskell does is they, pro you know, the compiler processes all those um, sequences of actions orders them into kind of a sequences and then takes the particular state of the world, uh, which has those input kind of typed in and then transforms it to the outside, uh, makes this kind of a transition from the state of the world from one state of the world to the other state of the world and then prints whatever the, the new state of the world is. So from outside, it appears as if we have a normal, um, uh, imperative kind of way of dealing with the external effects, but actually in Haskell, the external effects 
are dealt exactly the same way as the internal effects. And then the main function has a very you know, unique property of being able to actually dump it out and read it out from the, from the outside world. So if you have your IO functions like not in the main, like in, in, the, yeah, in your kind of library, they are all pure because they always take a certain state of the world and produce consistently the same state of the world um, given the initial state. So there is no uh, like there is no randomness. There is nothing that can hap that can change that you get the mapping differently. The mapping is always the same, and that's what pure functions are. Uh, but you have those kind of external effects that happen because those I/O actions are sequenced inside a main function, and they actually have you know noticeable external effects on the screen of the computer. Um, so even though the functions are pure, you still get kind of the effectful computations done, right? Um, <clears throat> informally, we say that the functions which use IO monad are impure, um, which, which effectively means that they have those kind of effects, um, which, yeah, it's kind of a, a bet. Uh, yeah, you, we have to distinguish somehow the, the functions which do have those sort of external effects or not. Like all the internal effects, uh, the monads which do have internal effects, they are easier to deal with because they don't, even though you do sequence them as well, they have internally, they, there is no difference. The, the behavior internally between uh, the IO monad and those internal monads is exactly the same. It's just that this one has this unique property because of the main function that it actually results um, results in uh, external external effects, right? So effects that are beyond the containment of your program itself. Um, so if you run your program like uh, back and forth multiple times, then on the screen of the computer, you will have different things, right? But if you run this program, like internal program back and forth multiple times, you will achieve the state which is exactly the same as if you run it once, right? So if you do steps like forward and then backwards and forward, the state, even though you have this kind of mutable state in your monads, the, the state will be exactly the same. Here, because we have this main function and because we have those potential side effects external to your program, then if you run it forward and backwards and forward, then of course the internal state will be consistent, but the external state is not because you do have this sort of uh, you know external uh, world that you are affected by your computation. So I don't know if that helps for you to kind of uh, understand it, but um, for me that that kind of works. Um, I do get the internal state quite well, and especially if you like either is fine, um, even, even maybe is fine, uh, but you really get kind of like click of what this internal state is once you start using the state monad. Um, so the, the state monad is quite, quite nice to represent kind of a mutability. Um, and then it sort of is just one extra transition to IO uh, from the state monad because uh, the, uh, the IO monad has this additional property of dumping something to the outside of your program, right? All those are just within the context, you know, con confinement of your of your program itself. <clears throat> All right, so that's uh, a bit of a ranty discussion. Uh, do you have any questions? I think from assignment uh, from task one and two, you don't really need to get it. Uh, but once you start doing assignment one, and one once you start dealing with the board and then you have to con continue to care of what state the board is in, then you will notice that uh, you may benefit from using a monad. Um, and I didn't, like I did the, assi uh, the, the, um, the assignment one without using a, a monadic, monadic state. I did it with the, um, uh, just with the pure functions, uh, but I can see I can refactor it and I can benefit from using the monadic expressions, especially for predicting the moves, uh, because I have to kind of sequence certain operations on top of the board, because you know you have to find the next move 
uh, from the current position. And then you have to find out the response of the other player. So if the other player can like finish the game, maybe that move is not the best. Like you want a move which doesn't allow the play the next uh, the the opponent to kind of uh, you know win the game, right? Uh, you want to avoid it. So you have to sequence certain things, and then uh, doing the uh, monadic expressions might make the code kind of nicer to work with. Uh, but it, it's not strictly necessary. And also in the assignment, you can just use just a random move. Like if you don't want to be uh, smart too much about your next move, you can just do a, a randomness. So the randomness is kind of a, a cute way of getting why Haskell is a pure language. So how, how we do a, a randomness? Um, you have a random number generator, uh, right? Um, so you have some sort of random number generator and you can ask it, you know, abstractly, let's say, you want to get a next int from it, right? Um, and the int is sort of pseudo random, right? So given a seed, this get int always gives you the same value, right? So how can you get uh, the next uh, random value? Well, you have to make it such that uh, get int returns you two things. It returns you this kind of uh, random number from the current state of the random number generator and returns you the next state of the random number generator such that when you want the second random number, you have to ask get int on, the, on this, you know, uh, if this one is the zero one, so you start from this one, then if you keep asking this one for a random number, you will always get the same number because it's the, you know, the, the random number generator is in the same state. So if you say, give me the next int from this random number generator, the, the RND zero, you're gonna get the same number. But if you sequence them, so if you say, okay, uh, I want to get a random number from random zero, then you get two values, you get this, you know, unique uh, random value and the next state of the random number generator. So then you you will, um, yeah, so uh, it's a little bit messy. So let's uh, say get int will have a, a signature such that it takes the random number generator, gives you some, let's say it gi gives you an int and it also gives you a new uh, random number, right? So it gives you two things um, and you can kind of, make it into a, uh, you, you can make it, uh, yeah, 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 you can make it, come on, Vim. you can make it into a pair, right? So you can say, well, my get int takes a number, a uh, random number generator and returns me an int and the next state of the random number generator such that you can reuse it right? Such that when I'm calling, um, so I would kind of, uh, so in, uh, so I will have um, my first number and the state of the random number generator. If I call it get int on the, uh, the you know, the, the zeroth one. Uh, and then if I want the second number, I would have to say, okay, let, let's, let's the second F1 and g1 equals get int from uh, from g, right? So now I have two numbers. I have um, f and f1. If you want the third random number, you would have to say, okay, I want another random number, uh, and I will. I'm gonna get a new random number generator, and uh, you're gonna do this, right? So you have to sequence them. Uh, in order to get consecutive random numbers, because you know you don't have side effects, you don't have kind of randomness being able, like a function being able to return something else from a given input, right? In imperative programming, if I have get int, uh, which operates, which takes uh, some sort of a random number generator, um, then I don't have to care of the internal state of the random number generator, right? So I, I have some sort of, usually in imperative, you have some sort of random number generator and you call it multiple times. And that gives you different outcome every time you call it, right? Uh, that's not possible in Haskell. You cannot get output which is different every time you call it uh, with the same input. So 
given the same input, you always have to get the same output, right? All right, so that's um, the monads. It took longer than I thought it's gonna take. Um, so uh, next topic. Uh, next topic is decentralization in computing and architectures, like how you organize your software. So it's a little bit different topic. Uh, it's a little bit more, um, we have to change our heads. So, you know, from programmers and kind of uh, dealing with the language, we now become kind of a software architects. And we have to deal with uh, questions of how do we build software that it's robust and that's flexible and that's, um, you know, maintainable and allow us to evolve it. Okay, so those are kind of a different, um, different questions. So before we start, uh, let me uh, quit uh, this and I will kind of go to the demo. So I have a um, couple of demos here. I pu push them to the course repo. Um, it's a simple hello chat, like a hello, um, not, not hello, like um, echo client. That's what we did with a standard input, standard output before, right? Remember we had kind of um, an ability to read something from the, um, from the standard input and then kind of uh, print it to the standard output. Um, and we did, we, we in the Go, Golang course, we did a simple client server such that we could have um, a, a connection between um, the uh, input. So, so one, once uh, part of the application was a client and the other one was sort of like a server. And then the clients were serving, uh, pushing stuff from the standard input to the, to the server. And the server was kind of uh, distributing it to, to all the clients. And then it kind of worked, but Every time you deal with standard input, if you close the connection, like if you close the, the, the pipe, uh, the program will, would kind of finish. Uh, and also uh, when you stop the server, uh, then all the clients were kind of dead, right? So if I have multiple clients talking to the server and then the server needs to be rebooted, right? So I have maintenance and I upgraded the ser server. So I have to shut it down and restart it then all the connections with the existing clients would go down, right? So that, that it was re really fr fragile, right? So it worked, but it was quite fragile. So let me draw uh, an example. Yeah, so let's see. So if I have, um, yeah, let's say I have uh, multiple clients um, and then I have sort of a server and I have a connection between the clients and the server. Uh, and then every time I kind of kill that, it kills all the, all the connections, right? So that's not good. So what's, uh, what's the solution to this? So if you want to be able to upgrade or modify uh, this, this uh, thing here, uh, but you don't want to lose the connection of, of your components. Don't think them as, as programs or as um, sort of a, you know, web browser type of programs. Think of them as components of your, of your system. So my application is this. This is my entire application. It's, let's say it's some sort of game. Uh, I have some components. I have some things. I have some, you know, uh, maybe I, this is like a, a rendering engine, right? So it, it uses some sort of, um, Component, entity component systems, and it has a connection with some of the uh, state of my objects. I don't know, whatever that is, right? Anyway, I, I need to restart this and I don't want to break all these connections, right? So what can I do? What's the kind of the mechanism typically to, to decouple uh, my linking uh, between those two things? Um, you can think of it, um, slightly differently. So if I have, uh, let's say, I have um, functions, right? So I have two functions uh, and I have um, another um, function which uh, 
these guys are using, right? So I have, um, I have something like this. I have dependency, um, maybe, let's say, maybe this is a database, right? So I have some sort of a DB object. Um, and then these guys have a reference to that DB object, right? Um, and then uh, they, they use this DB object. Uh, and my program runs and everything works. But at some point I say, oh, I need to upgrade this. I need to um, like remove that reference. I need to change this uh, to a new object. Right, so I need to up update this. Uh, and um, instead of these guys calling on the old reference, they have to call on the new reference. I, I had to dispose this. Uh, then, um, you know, th this link is broken. So now they should talk to this guy, right? So how do we do that? Uh, how, how do we make some component being flexible enough such that um, I can swap this actual instance and this will continue to work. Yeah, so Sindra is suggesting pointers. Um, pointers is good, but it has limits. So for example, if I had to release the, the memory for this guy and I've, I've used a pointer, right? So these guys were pointing to, to this guy, then uh, me, you know, uh, yeah, I, so, so, uh, the answer is co almost correct. We, we don't need a pointer. We want a reference to a pointer, right? So um, like we, we want something that is kind of here um, that this, this ambiguates me, like it, it separates me from what it actually points to, right? So yes, if this is a pointer to where the, um, the thing is and these guys are using that pointer, uh, then that's great. Yeah, that will work. So you can say, yeah, I, I need a pointer. But, um, you know, if those guys are pointers also, then this guy doesn't really, like, we could use uh, in C, we would use a pointer. But in C++ or some other uh, languages, we have a concept of a reference, right? So I can um, make a reference to a pointer and then, um, like I can change it and I can update this reference to point to a different thing and it will kind of work fine, right? Uh, if those are, uh, you can do it in different ways. You, you can manage with pointers or with references depending what constructs you have in the language, right? Um, so if we now go back here, uh, you see we kind of introduced, um, we introduced this we sort of introduce this, um, this ambiguation layer, this ambiguation thing, which these guys talk to. Uh, and then uh, this, it, like it's kind of like a um, proxy of, of who you really want to talk to, right? So normally if you have this kind of architecture and you have some sort of a component which needs to talk to three components, you have to like uh, inject something in the middle which will be kind of um, um, working as, a, as some sort of a bus, right? So instead of um, you talking directly to the, to, to the service, uh, service provider or, or, or service, yeah, let me move that so I can delete those. Now we have kind of something like this. Uh, these guys talk to this. And then this thing call, talks to that one, right? Um, and from the software components all the way to your kind of a microservice or service-oriented architecture, you have different things that fit fit in here, right? So one thing that fits in here is, uh, uh, for example, RabbitMQ, right? So RabbitMQ is a messaging broker. Um, it's open source messaging broker, which I, I uh, which, which is written in Erlang. It's high quality uh, messaging uh, broker, which allows you to route uh, traffic from um, kind of uh, consumers to producers and something like this, whatever, right? Uh, so we, we have multiple solutions here. Uh, one, for example, is 
RabbitMQ. Another flavor of the month is Kafka. Uh, another one uh, written in, um, so if you search uh, messaging bus or broker in Java, there is, um, yeah, so Spring you can use for it. Uh, uh, Java message service. Um, there was one other one in Java that, uh, so I guess Kafka is the kind of the current flavor of the month. Anyway, you, you have some solutions that you can kind of squeeze in here, uh, but usually what, what it is, it's another uh, component which sits in there, right? So in, in, in this case, I, used to have four components. I used to have one, two, three, four components. Now I have five components. I made my architecture like uh, more uh, complex. And also usually that thing is quite fat and quite bulky and uh, it even need, sometimes it needs to be its own appliance in your rack server, which uh, it actually, you know, does things, right? Um, it's very non agile and it's very heavy. Uh, to inject something like this in, into your architecture, right? Uh, another solution you could use is you say, well, uh, we, I can use REST, right? I can use web technology. That's what you're learning in cloud. And I can inject it here and have kind of a very nice microservice architecture such that uh, I have my services. They all talk through REST uh, and it, it is nice, but it, it is kind of fake in a sense. Like if, you, if you're doing it for your, like, Again, like we, what we want is we want this to be, uh, we want our system. So we want our, oops, uh, that's stupid. Yeah, so our system is this and we want our system to be modular and very agile such that we can move the parts in and out and shut them down, put them back and so on. And now we are required to have this heavy machinery in the middle being a web server or being kind of a, you know, Kafka or whatever that is, which allows us to separate services. But in fact, if you like try to pull it, like if you take this kind of a, and you pull it out, you, you will see that everything hangs on it. You, you have kind of a monolithic architecture that has all those services attached to it, but in, a, in, a, in a essence, it is still kind of a very monolithic, very heavy, um, uh, solution to, to kind of decomposing your application. And it doesn't really work that well. So ideally, what you would like to have is you would like to have something that allows you to, uh, yeah, let me delete this, something that allows you to do this without the heavy uh, middle, the, the middleware at all, right? Uh, how could you do that? Well, um, you see here we have to introduce some sort of a reference. Like you cannot really avoid having something in the middle. Like you have a very lightweight machinery, which is uh, either pointers or references. Um, and that allows you to, de um, to uh, separate one layer from another, right? So I have um, two layers. I have one layer here and I have a layer there. And the mechanism here is extremely trivial, extremely simple. And in fact, it's it's like in the middle, there is nothing really, uh, because that thing, that red thing, that, that reference thing kind of sits here, right? Uh, so the, the middle part continues to be extremely lightweight. Uh, we, we, we know we don't have anything here. Uh, instead, uh, what, what we, changed is we made that um, these guys have kind of a, a, a reference which points to particular thing, but that reference can be uh, mutated, can be changed such that it points to this new thing at will, right? Uh, so they kind of know uh, by, by having this pointer or this reference what they should use. And then your uh, software can kind of say, yeah, by the way, that has changed. And instead of pointing here, now it points here. 
and it like your app doesn't care, like your module doesn't care. It just has this kind of little thing here, uh, which points to whatever it needs to use and it works, right? So we would like to have the same here without this heavy machinery. And the answer is um, uh, zero MQ. So th the answer is the technology which we kind of are uh, discussing in, in this module. Uh, and it is in a form of a small library. So instead of a kind of a middleware of some sort of a system or component that it sits in here, we have kind of a, a small library which sits in all your components uh, or like it doesn't really sit there, but they, you know, the library is here and the, the guys kind of use the library, but it's for all the components separate. And here you have this sort of a fuzziness which the library generates and hel helps you to build. And then you can arrange the flow of your communication, the flow of your dependencies and the flow of your um, uh, mechanisms the way you really want, right? Um, so it's not a broker, it's a kind of a protocol stack which allows you to have something that looks like a broker without a broker, right? Uh, so the, the um, you know, most of the messaging queues uh, terminology has some sort of a MQ, like, you know, message queue or middleware queue or whatever you want to, 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 to say. So usually they are called some, some something MQ. And then zero MQ is no different. It, it's called zero MQ. Uh, and the zero says that there is no broker actually. Uh, all the other solutions, they, you know, require you to have a broker. Uh, zero MQ doesn't, right? Um, so that's one big difference. The, the second big difference is that um, most brokers are, are not necessarily agnostic about the messaging or how, what you can communicate. Most of them use some sort of a, um, protocol constraints of what you want to be passing around. Whereas with zero MQ, there is no, constraint and also zero MQ is not based on the content, it's based on the concept of frames. Uh, and then the content is up to you to design. You can use strings, you can use uh, byte buffers, you can use whatever you want. With other ones, most of the time as well. But here you have kind of a, a, a different flexibility of how you arrange it. And you, yeah, you're kind of working on a slightly lower level than for example, with, with RabbitMQ. So you have more power and you have more independence of how you arrange it and how you design it to work with your particular application, okay? So why, um, let, let me go to uh, zero MQ documentation. And if you um, start the documentation, one thing that kind of jumps at you is that you are language independent. So you can uh, work with whatever language you want uh, and in your case, you will be probably working with Go, Haskell and Rust. Um, and you can sort of build different modules or different parts of your application in whatever language you want and it will kind of plug in very nicely. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the first thing. Um, the second thing is that you are uh, quite transport independent, right? So we have uh, with zero MQ ability to do this kind of echo client, which we did with TCP IP. Uh, so the TCP is one of the um, protocols that you can, you can use, but you can use in memory uh, inter-process communication as well. So you can basically uh, bypass the, um, the networking stack altogether. If you're building it for your components inside your own uh, single application and do communication kind of in process. Uh, and you can also do that inter process, right? So in process is if you have uh, multiple threads in the same process uh, and then they can talk to each other, they can communicate. And inter processes, you have uh, uh, threads which are living in a separate processes. Uh, or even separate applications, but on the same computer, such that you don't need to use network, you don't need to use TCP IP, but you can use the uh, named pipes. So you are familiar with named pipes already uh, because we tried to do that for some of the uh, work that we did, uh, such that you can use that as well. And then you have um, additional, like you can 
use the mechanism with WebSockets. So you can communicate from a web application to another web application or to the server. You can communicate from a, a server site to the mobile site, or you can kind of uh, communicate. Um, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's really, really flexible, right? Um, so um, the concepts are kind of the same for all the languages. And <clears throat> the important part are the patterns of how um, the, um, the communication works. And there are a couple of initial ones that you can build more complex things with, right? So in our, um, in our initial thing, we've already started with um, one of the patterns, which is we have multiple clients and they like uh, either this guy needs something from multiple clients or they all need something from, from this guy, right? So it's a communication which is um, from a particular component to let's say three components. And when this component announces something, all three components should get it. Then you use a pattern which is called publish subscribe. Um, so in publish subscribe, um, let's have a quick look uh, into the diagram. So yeah, publish subscribe works kind of looks like this. Um, so you have some sort of a publisher and then the publisher uh, announces something and then all the customers which are interested in that particular topic or particular thing, they will get the notification. So we use uh, a notion of a socket, uh, but it's it's not like your typical TCP IP socket. It's a, a more abstract notion of a socket. It also has, an, uh, if you're using a TCP, up, um, TCP communication uh, mechanisms, it has kind of a URI like you would expect. So you have an IP address and the port. Uh, if you're using inter-process communication, it would be like a file path to your named pipe. Um, and then this publisher kind of announces where it listens and then all the kind of our customers connect to it. And then every notification gets to everybody, right? Um, so PubSoup, is the type of a socket. So when you're in instantiating it, it kind of uh, generates the, uh, the particular type for the socket. And then uh, it wires up internally, like the library kind of wires things up for you. Uh, so if we go to our example, so I have a zero MQ demo in Haskell. So if we uh, code, if we have a quick peek at, at how it looks like, um, I have used uh, um, I've used uh, Haskell in such a way that I can generate from a one stack project I can generate two executables, um, and I. Uh, put both publisher and subscriber into the same library, such my such that my app, uh, the the two main functions are very simple. They just say, okay, I am a subscriber, and this main says I am a publisher. Uh, but both the the functionalities are in kind of a single file in the library file. Um, so, as I said, um, the publisher uses bind and the subscribers use connect. Um, you can, you're not forced to do that. You can swap them around. Uh, but normally if something is more stable, something kind of persists more in your network, uh, usually you, you make it identifiable. And then when you make it identifiable, then you use a bind because the connects are kind of more anonymous. Uh, the bind doesn't care from where the connects happen. Uh, but the connects have to know to whom to connect, right? So the um, this guy makes a bind to a particular address. And the address, I said, okay, open the connection on all the interfaces on this port. Um, and then the, the subscribers will kind of connect using a local host and that port uh, to the... Um, to 
to, to the publisher. And then um, that's all that you need to wire that up. You, you effectively need like three lines of code to wire things up uh, for TCP IP communication, or you can change this to use the in-process one uh, if you want. Um, and then if you if you run it, so if I say uh, stack run, so what happens if I run the subscriber first? Uh, normally what would happen is that it would quit saying there is no server uh, listening like on port 555, so I cannot connect, right? So if you build your own application like that, the way we did in Golang uh, and you start your subscriber first, it will quit, it will not start because to start, you have to connect to this kind of a server socket. But if we do that in um, in here in, with zero MQ, well, it it connects, right? It it connects to something that doesn't exist yet, right? Uh, that's already pretty uh, spectacular. Um, so if I go, okay. So let me make it bigger. So another nice thing is that um, I have written. Um, so let's open that one. I have written a, a same client server part in Golang, uh, and it's also in the in the um, in the course uh, repo as well. Uh, so if you go to the Golang uh, version, um, I will not update it yet. So it basically is the same. So the publisher is using bind, uh, and it also it, it's basically exactly the same app, right? Uh, I have a publisher and subscriber. Uh, this time I went for a model where I have a single executable and I use the flags to distinguish whether I want to run the, the, uh, you know, the publisher or the subscriber. Um, again, it's a couple of lines of code, like three lines of code. Uh, and it, um, the publisher again uses the publish uh, socket, uh, opens the same connection on the port 5555 and then the subscriber does the yeah the reverse. And then for the publisher, you have to you you have a, a call sent, which basically sends something to all the clients which are connected. And on the client side, you have a call called receive. Um, and then you have a flag that you pass, and you say I don't pass any flags, like you pass zero, um, such that if you don't pass any flags, this call will wait until something happens on the channel right on the on the queue and that's why our like if you go here um so this is the golang client and this is the uh that's not the one where is my i lost the haskell where is the haskell one so this is the golang Let's make it a little bit smaller. So it's here. And then where where are you? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So this is the yeah, let's kill the subscriber again. Clear it. Uh, so this is I'm running here uh, the subscriber in Haskell. And it kind of runs and waits. And here I will run the server on the uh, in the Golang. So uh, go build, let's build it. Right, and then it's called 0MQ and then I can uh, call it with some uh, parameters. So if I say help, uh, I can call it with a name or I can call it with a flag, which will make it as a make it a publisher, right? Uh, so if I don't run it with anything, it will be a client. If I run it with pub, it will become a, a publisher. So now I run a publisher. I allow the socket because it opened now the socket, um, and now I can. Um, uh, the publisher has some uh, something to publish, so I can say hello. And when the publisher publishes something, then all the subscribers will get it. And you see uh, the, the Go subscriber got the Haskell publisher uh, information. Uh, even though I started that before this guy started, right? Um, so now I can queue the server and then my 
uh, subscriber still hangs around and still works. And what I can do is I can go, um, let's open this uh, again. So if you now go to the, uh, so I'm now in the Haskell uh, folder uh, and I'm gonna run stack run publisher. I'm gonna run um, Haskell publisher. So now um, the Haskell publisher will, will uh, compile and run. All right, it, uh, remember that my client, the, the Haskell client continues to run, right? Uh, and I say hello from Haskell. And my client, my uh, Haskell client continues to work, continues to receive the messages, uh, even though I shut down my Go implementation, I substituted it with Haskell implementation while the system continues to work, right? Um, so that demonstrates that first of all, I have, um, um, you know, a, a big flexibility. Uh, I, of course, I can shut the clients and reconnect the clients to the server. Uh, that's kind of relatively normal. Like with the previous Go implementation, we had the same. So if the client died, we close the connection and we say, yeah, uh, we kind of close it. And then we wait for new uh, on the server, wait for new connections. Uh, but here I can shut the server replace the completely the implementation with one language to another and my clients continue to work as if nothing happened right um, so that's kind of a, a, a cool property and then you have um, other things so you have published subscribe is just one pattern that you can use but you can for example um, mix it with uh, you know um, a proxy such that you have multiple publishers with multiple subscribers working in kind of a this pattern, right? So I have um, kind of a proxy in the middle, which allows me to cross and match uh, different publishers and subscribers. What if I have a simple thing that I only have um, uh, uh, request response, right? So if I have request response, I can do, um, there is a, let me see. Uh, yeah, so let's go, maybe the diagram is here. Yeah, so that the normal typical pattern is you you um, have a reply on the server side, you, you call your socket rep, which is for replies. And then on the client side, you call it rec, which is for requests. And then you have request reply pattern, right? Uh, that's a kind of a different pattern that you can do. Um, you can mix uh, request and replies with some middleware, which disambiguates, like or um, you know, inject something in the middle. So this request reply, for example, we try to do with the with the games. So um, if I have, um, and by the way, you can use standard input and standard output for the uh, for the communication protocol as well, like the 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 the, the panel, the, the channels as well. So what we tried to do was uh, we have program one uh, communicating uh, with the in and out, um, and then uh, program two was trying to crack it with out and in kind of a, and you have a matching pair. But if you hook them up together, then you don't know what is happening. Like you don't see it, right? So what you can do is you can kind of a plug a middleware, which um, takes kind of an in, actually it takes out and in from uh, one of them uh, and in and out from the other. And it kind of works like a, a middleware, which you, again, you you hook up program one and program two together, but you have this middleware which allows you to do something in the middle. Uh, so you don't change this. Uh, this works exactly the same as before. And this one works exactly the same as before. And they think they work with each other the same as before, but you kind of injected something in the middle, which allows you to do kind of extra things 
Um, so you have kind of a lot of patterns here that you can uh, uh, combine uh, with a, a more kind of uh, complicated architectures. And it kind of your requirements are the limit. Like you are the architect of how you're hooking those things together and how you're organizing it. Um, and the idea here is not necessary that it needs to be a network application. It doesn't have to be a network application. It, you can do that inside your application itself, uh, such that you decompose your, your modules into those independent blocks. And you can use Go routines, or you can use Haskell together with Go routines to achieve certain kind of processing concurrently uh, in such a way that you deal with concurrency through this message passing. So one way of dealing with concurrency is to use um, threads and locks and semaphores. Uh, but another one is to think about the application in such a way that it's a data flow that I don't need to lock. I just have to process data. Uh, and then you have your kind of queues and you have your input and outputs. Uh, and then you make everything kind of lockless. So uh, the only locking that happens is in the moment where your client or your subscriber needs to wait for something. Uh, and that's the, the mechanism here, right? So as we say, um, for, um, so let, yeah, in, in Golang, it's a little bit cleaner. So let, let, let me use the Golang example. So in Golang, this flag, so here, this call is blocking and it waits for any message to, uh, to show up. If I put a flag here, there is a flag which says, make this call non-blocking. And that if, if there is nothing in the queue, then um, just continue, right? Uh, so we have a synchronous uh, mechanism for doing this receive uh, part. Uh, and subscribe, um, subscribe, pu publish subscribe, um, you have multiple subscribers and the publish publishes to all of them. But what if you have a task and you only want some workers to, to pick it up? Then you use um, not pub sub, but you use a mechanism which is called push-pull. Uh, so again, if you go to the, um, to the patterns and you search for pull, um, you have, um, yeah, you have those. So you have a uh, pops up, you have request reply, and you have push-pull. With push-pull, it's kind of almost like with pops up, but, um, the, the push only pushes one version to one client, even if you have multiple clients. And it tries to do it in kind of a, a particular way, like maybe round robin or some balancing way such that you don't overload a particular client, right? Um, so uh, we're running out of time. Um, so the idea here is that you check the code uh, from the uh, code samples that I posted on the uh, on the pro, um, on the course repository, um, read a little bit about the zero MQ patterns. You don't need to go beyond uh, this, this, or this. Uh, uh, for most applications that you start with, those three are all you need. Uh, you don't need to deal with kind of a more complex uh, patterns, and they are very simple. Like uh, as as I showed you. Uh, just changing to pull, push pull is just you change those two things. Uh, and most of the rest is the same. And it's like three lines of code in any language that you want. Um, and if you don't want to use sockets, if you're doing it for your own, um, your own internal application itself, then you just change it to the in process uh, transport. Uh, and then it will be uh, super eff efficient. Uh, and you can now start to think how you decompose your architecture, your, your components of your, of your system in such a way that they are decoupled, that you can upgrade one without touching the other one or swap them with something else or mix and match your programming languages the way that you want, uh, such that it kind of frees you from kind of a, a monolithic um, architectures, okay? Uh, I posted also on the, uh, on the course wiki some, so if you go to lectures, uh, it's actually not that, I, I couldn't find a very good zero MQ uh, videos. Um, so 
I suggest you just skim through the Wikipedia 0MQ um, page and go to the 0MQ guide document for, for more details. And you can check, um, you can check those, uh, those three videos. So this one, is, um, this one is better than this one. This one is not so good, but this one kind of talks about microservice architectures and service oriented architectures. And it's, uh, yeah, you may get some value of that. It's not that good. Uh, that one is a little bit better, uh, but that one is quite old. Uh, so that one is like um, nine years old or something. Um, I like this one the most, but this one is not about zero MQ. This one is about the need for software to be decentralized uh, and why it makes sense. So uh, out of those three resources, if you want to watch just one, watch the last one. Uh, the rest you can get from the guide. You don't need to watch those other three, but uh, watch this one. This one is the most important. And I've it kind of really changed the way I think about software uh, because I used to think about it in a more traditional way, uh, but now I'm kind of sold on the idea of decentralization and that the, the way that um, software should be constructed. Uh, we, we will continue this discussion on Thursday. So I will talk a little bit more about this, but if you watch the video, um, I, I think you, you will like it. it. It starts a little bit slow. You can skip the first five minutes, I think. Uh, but then it gets quite interesting. So I encourage you to do that. All right, we don't have time for questions. So I will shut the, the, the stream now, um, but uh, I will see you on Thursday and bring your questions on Thursday. Yeah, thank you.